this one. Okay, Mr. Zingli. Six weeks after Arthur, he, he comes onto the scene. Mom gives birth to him and Father Bartholomew, a parish priest and a teacher. So he goes to live with his uncle at the age of five. But basically I think this was more looking for space in the home because of the number of children that they had. Yeah. <laughs> and it worked out pretty well for him because his uncle was by the means to send him for, for Latin classes. <laughs> so he had... Uh, um, it is this Ulrich and um, yeah, Zwingli. Zwingli. Uh, okay, so we so he had learned Latin, uh, obviously by the time he went to university. But the private team going to university is already attracted to the monastic life, somehow. But his uncle and his father is not too happy about this, so just before he can get settled there, they sort him out. And uh, they registered him at the university of Vienna, where he gets expelled in the same year. <laughs> then back in 1500, he goes on to the University of Basel, of Basel in 1502. Mm -hmm. Here he is required to study the sentences of Peter Lombard, upon which Thomas would have lectured. And here is important. As we claim, Wittenbach is the first to introduce him to the Gospel. It was he who taught him to see the evils and abuses of it, indulgences. So besides Luther, and Luther's fame had already spread, plus his tracts and his writings, so there was others well aware of what was going on in Europe. Um, that started all at a very young age to write. The supreme authority of the Bible, the death of Christ alone, the price of remission of sins, and that faith is the key which unlocks the treasury of forgiveness. Then in Basel, he also becomes acquainted with the works of Thomas Aquinas and Erasmus. You remember Erasmus, a humanist scholar, or humanist approach to, to the Christian theology. Um, they say Zingli had the capacity to form lasting relationship, Jacob von van Vienna and Leo Jan Basil, of which we will hear later in his life again. These friendships are renewed over and over again. Uh, but they're also broken at some stage. Uh, here was the funny part when I read this. It says that Bartholomew's uncle possibly supported him at the college, but Students often used to beg for money also if they were short. <laughs> uh, and this is how he derived his income, obviously at that time. There's seven years of study, he attains his BA, Master of Arts degree at the University of Basel. Then, despite the fact he's not a danger to the priesthood as yet, his uncle recommended him for parish priest at Glarus. And he's now only how old? Born in 18, 1484, this is 1505. He's 21 years old. 21 years old. Yeah. He's already recommended uh, for a parish priest at Glarus. Sure. And in fact, he's the, founds, uh, the town's first choice. But there was already someone appointed to the post. Huh. He literally had to buy the post. You will see later that when he leaves Glarus, he still actually owes the town, uh, this guy some money, the priest some money, because of the post he purchased. But the Glarus residence actually helps him out and pays off the, the, the debt for him. Because yeah, so you can actually you could purchase, purchase a post back. You had to purchase the post. You had to purchase the post. Remember, there was a pension attached to it by the papacy. Okay, yeah, yeah. So he, this guy's going to lose his pension now if he has to hand over the post. Yes. So he literally sells it to him. Alright, okay. So he's ordained as a priest and he celebrates his first Mass on 29 September in his native village, Voltaus. So this is done all at home before he leaves to Glarus. Uh, compared to Luther, he seemed by temperament, culture and education to be completely devoid of the earnestness that characterized Luther's quest for a gracious God. Yeah, he's more the intellectual. Mm. Then uh, 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 the focus is more on the intellectual end than the spiritual side. That only comes later in his career, mm. when there's a couple of events that pushes him in that direction. Uh, training of home and university seems to have led him to focus on the intellectual side of the Christian faith. Then the Glarus years. Now he's in the in the ministry. This is Luther's first year in the monastery. Well, this is 
assuming his first year as parish priest. So we use this already busy writing of starting to write obviously. Um, he only gets to know of Luther's writings a bit later on. Mm. So obviously it's the spread of, of, of the tracts and, and the writings by the press that gets to, gets to his attention. Yeah. But he seems to work on his ace uh, uh, first before that uh, actually happens. Yeah. Before he actually starts reading the works of Luther. He, doesn't, he hasn't actually read the full works of Luther until a later stage in his life. Glarus has about 13 inhabitants, weaving was the major industry, but the cash flow came from the mercenary trade. Can you believe it? They had a mercenary trade at that stage already. The three original cantons had won the independence. Cantons would normally be a city plus a huge amount of suburbs. One main city with a huge amount of suburbs okay. that formed a, a quite a big area. And they would call it a canton and there would be a council that used to run this canton. Um, or a city council. The three original cantons won the independence from the Habsburg in the 14th century. Eventually, the three states became the nucleus of the Swiss Confederation by virtue of the superior performance on the battlefield. Independence is gained in 1291. And it says that the Swiss were of the same mind, at least these three cantons. There was a love for liberty and independence despite the number of ethnic and language characteristic differences. Amazing. Hmm. It's something like your ideology can draw you together despite your distinctions in color, creed or whatever. Mm. It's the ideologies that brings them together. Mm. And that is why the French is also un so unique. If you think about the French liberty and they have this the yeah, three yeah, saints, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same type of uh, same type of type yeah. of thing. There was compulsory military service, they were therefore they were able to field the well equipped army upon little notice. And other European nations, including the papacy, would often call upon these mercenary troops mm -hmm. if they needed them for war. Now, Zingwili was also a chaplain to the Swiss troops, and he would. Oh, this yeah. corruption stretch. And he would. And he would. He would, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he would accompany them to to the battlefield. They like a political party there. Yeah. Pope Julius II, the warrior pope, detested and radical by Erasmus, often by his use of the Swiss mercenaries to liberate the Italian cities. Um, in fact, that would count against them later yeah. because they never pay their bill. I'll t you'll see now, you'll see later why it counts against them. Um, the latter so often victorious suffered the loss of 10,000 men against the French at Monza in 1550. Mm. And this was the first incident that would affect him greatly in a, in, in, in a spiritual sense. Yeah. The French had hired from the Swiss to fight their own. That's how they got beat, with their own men. So Zwingli was never to escape the memories of the horror of that experience and Erasmus with his vigorous tracks against war reinforced the young chaplain's misgivings regarding mercenary trade or traffic. And that is how his anti-war stance develops. Because originally he mm. went with him as chaplain, but he did not clearly think out the mercenary trade. Uh, Erasmus has thought it through and his writings affect him and change his thinking. Yes, about yes, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Then there's a new conscience which, uh, which sweeps the nation. He also acquires a, acquired a library which he filled with the works of Aristotle, Oregon, Jerome, Augustine and Erasmus. In fact, he taught himself Greek. And that is, not, he actually taught himself yes, Greek. Yeah. that is not an easy thing to do. They didn't have the access to, to, to the languages that we yes. have today, so no. it must have been very, very tough. In 1516, Erasmus releases the first edition of the New Testament based on the four best manuscripts available. The Froben edition carried the text of the Vulgate on the one side of each page and the Greek on the other. So, inspired by Erasmus' latest contribution, Zwingli set out to Basel to meet the famous humanist scholar. He also opened up a school for, for the promising boys of the parish and faithful pastor to his troubled congregation. Then eventually his opposition to the mercenary traffic through fire and he was forced to leave Glarus. 
A letter to his friend Dr. Jacob von Watt confirms that his departure was a coerced one. He, he left an indelible mark upon the mountain hamlet before being forced from Glarus by the cohorts of Francis I. Then he moves on to Einsiedel, if that's how you pronounce it. No, 1516 to 1580, chaplain of the Shrine of Meinrad, which is the center of the cult of Mary worship in Switzerland then and now. It hasn't changed. Despite all of what has taken place, mm -hmm. the theology of that particular shrine remains the same. What the it's the worship of, of objects. Yeah. And um, it's amazing to think that all of that took place and none of it remained there specifically. Mm -hmm. What was there remained itself. Remained, it could yeah. never it just never changed. No. I mean even despite today, the history. It's still there. Even still there. Until today, it's still there. Located in the Basilica of the Benedictine Monastery, twice ravaged by fire. So you have the small little ornate little building still a lift. Um, tradition tells us that the chap chapel apparently which, which was apparently dedicated in 80, 1948 by an angelic host, which was celebrated every seven years in Wrinkley's time. You know the same like the steps that was moved from Jerusalem. Mm. Yeah, an angelic host dedicated the temple in AD 1948. So I'm trying to figure out who saw this and who captured it and who actually mm. wrote it down because there's nothing of that in history. <laughs> um, what happened, however, that was a blessing in disguise for him because every time there was this dedication, mm. new people would come into the town. So his audiences were varied and it often changed. So he was able to preach to different audiences mm. and by virtue of that, his preaching was now being not only heard by others outside of, of the canton, um, they were going to tell others about his preaching hmm. because hmm. They, 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 they took to it. Um, well, that's the thing with good preaching, isn't it? The minute there's a guy that's, that, that, that's really preaching good stuff, the word spreads like, yeah, I must go listen to that guy, you know? The Benedictine monastery had two monks at that particular time who opened up the treasures of the ancient library in it with its priceless manuscripts. Both monks were patrons of the new learning and supported Zionist Christian humanism. So he's, all, he's got two monks there and they delve into study with him. So that's really cool at that particular time for him also. Um, the Ancidalian years might be termed the Erasmian years. Um, he develops the concept of the Christian faith called the philosophy of Christ. Um, uh, like I've said earlier, he learned Greek himself and he becomes a very accomplished Greek scholar. He also has his first skirmish with Berdin Samson. You remember Tetzel? Mm -hmm. Now this would be the Swiss counterpart. Okay. Selling indulgences. But he never gets into the canton because he gets one to stay, uh, like Tetzel gets one to stay out they deal with him very quickly um, and he has to leave. So English opposition to the indulgence system seen at the, is, is seen as an outrage of an enlightened humanist originally. Hmm. Again like Luther, they don't think he's anyone to worry about. They haven't learnt. Hmm. They see this happening in one, in the Swiss, they see it happening in Germany and they're not saying to themselves, here's something else happening here. Pride is a funny thing. In fact, if you, if you are blind, you will not see God at work. <laughs> Retrospect Zwingli claims to have begun to preach the gospel as early as 1516. So he's now, that would be 32 years old when he starts preaching the gospel. I began to preach the gospel before anyone in my locality had so much as heard the name of Luther, for I never left the pulpit without taking the words of the gospel as used in the mass service of the day and expounding the scripture. Although at first I relied much on, upon the fathers of Oregon, Ambrose, Jerome and Augustine as expositors and explainers. 
and then you have two uh, contemporaries at that particular time, Rihannes and Casper Hedia, who put seemingly self-understanding in proper perspective. Um, and they refer often to his preaching. I still in, can't in, mention. In, in, in very um, lucid terms. Yeah. The way he expounds the word, the way he makes it clear, is, is something that just captured them. Yeah. And they also write, and there's actually a record of it, that they spoke to his preaching and his, his, his understanding of the gospel. However, here's the problem Zingli still receives a papal pension. Yeah. He never lets go of it. No, of course But here already I want you to start seeing the difference between him and Luther. Yes. Hmm. They are very much different in, in their person and their methodology. He is appointed by acolyte chaplain on the 1st of September 1518 by, by Leo X or Leo 10 with the benefit of double his pension, which he duly refused. I think it was more than attempt to tie him down to Rome. Because somehow they must have sensed something is happening, um, not sure what it is, so now offering the double pension to see if they, if they can tie him down somewhat. Because if they can call him, a, if they can call him something else other than what he's preaching, it's going to count against him. Mm. So they they will attack your person sometimes. Definitely. If you respond and if your response is a wrong one, it's going to count against you. It's going to count you against your ministry eventually. Yeah. Zingli's Whitsuntide Pentecost sermon received a warm response. And the audience included 1,500 men from Zurich. He's then recommended by Oswald Myconius, verified by the 24 canons of the area, uh, and appointed people's priest at the Gross Munster in Zurich. Some of the canons does, however, raise question about his models. And um, he, well, he was a single, he, he was celibate. And apparently he was living with a woman, or at least uh, the claim was he had, he had fathered a child. Mm -hmm. And then they accused him, and when they accused him, he agreed to some of, of, of his leanings, and that, he, that he wasn't uh, absolutely uh, morally pure, so he didn't abstain necessarily from sex, but he, he, he did not uh, um, accede to the claim that that was his child, mm. or that he had, that he was the father of the child. Mm. So because he professes to his proclivities, he, it's almost as he's seen more than righteous than some of his counterparts, because some of them are really bad if you go into the history. Yeah, and they don't, <laughs> they don't, they don't, they don't have the, the moral, uh, the uh, humility to say, hey, look, yeah, I'm not no, moral. The, the moral ethos of that age wasn't a very good one whether it was in the local sphere or in, the, in, in the, the spiritual sphere of the church, it wasn't a very no. uh, good ethic. So he, they give him the post. Then he moves on to Zurich, obviously. Hmm. Now he starts his career there. Zwingli assumes his responsibility in 1 January 1590. Uh, the Gladys residents settled the balance on the purchase price of the office he vacated. <laughs> so he obviously endeared himself to the people if they would do that for him. Mm. Zurich was the chief city in the canton and one of the more important cities of the third cantons in the Swiss Confederation. 7,000 inhabitants, 57 secular priests, in addition to 200 monks, nuns and priests belonged to the four orders. An impressive and important religious center of German-speaking Switzerland to which Zwingli had come. Zwingli. And besides his pastoral duties, Zwingli was intent on magnifying his pulpit ministry. So you see, he had a plan and it's slowly developing. Yeah. Because he's busy studying the word and he's starting to find things with which doesn't agree like with Luther. Is that what Luther? 
Um, he's seeing things and beginning to understand that what the church is doing is not publicly based. There's traditions which can be refuted. The gospel, as he is beginning to understand it, refutes all of these traditions. Or go, the tradition goes against what the gospel is standing for. But I mean, those weren't even biblical traditions. They were, they were just made up. <laughs> well, at least they thought that they were biblical traditions. Um, after his formal induction, he thanks the canons for electing him and solicit their prayers, after which he announces that he would begin a continuous exposition of the Gospel of Matthew on the next day. Uh, but he's not able to finish this because there's a few things that happen. He continues the series uh, at a later date again. His deviation from tradition would start a religious revolution which, while still holding, to Erasmus' concept of reform. You remember Erasmus' concept of reform? Mm -hmm. Go back to the scriptures and canon law. Yeah. And try to reform from within. Reform. Don't leave the church. It's going to be more difficult to do that. Yeah. Stay within and see if you can bring the change mm -hmm. rather than move out. At this day, Zwingli saw no fundamental differences in Erasmus and Luther, nor the possibility of reformation without separation. But then tragedy strikes, a plague descends upon Zurich. And here is the second incident that hits him. Remember the first one? Was the war where the French had hired from the Swiss mercenaries, mm. beaten them, 10,000 lay dead in the field. And so for the first time he actually sees his men, his own people being slain in their youth. And that was worse to him than anything that he could imagine. Mm. Here a second event is the plague. Um, he gets seriously ill, in fact, but he recovers. The problem is his brother comes too early to Zurich. If he had stayed just maybe away a couple of months, come back later, the, the, the plague would not have gotten him. He comes too early, contracts the plague and he dies. And it's a terrible thing because apparently the bodies were stacking up and there were not enough grave diggers. They couldn't keep up with the amount of people dying and, and putting them in their graves. Yet despite all of this, he proves himself a faithful priest, unself in his ways, always considering others at that particular time. He became deathly ill, losing his brother Andrew to the fatal virus. A series of events precipitated the most serious spiritual crisis Zwingli had yet experienced. And the first one we talk about was at Monza, 10,000 of the flower of Swiss manhood lay dead. The second one was the play at Limmat, more than a quarter of Zurich dead. A quarter of the canton is dead. And his own impending death made him acutely aware of his sinfulness. Then you have Crisis 3, which is his brother Andrew, who had contracted the virus and died. Yet he refused to blame God. Instead, he wrote, I've learned to submit myself completely to his divine will. It's the maturity at, the, at, the, at these ages which astounds me already. Even mm -hmm. Luther, uh, they mature, matured very, very early yeah. with, in, in relation to, to God and the understanding of the nature of God. For someone to say that that early and to accept it is God's will, is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. In fact, it's not an easy thing to grasp, first of all. Yeah. The subsequent crisis marked the change from an enlightened humanist to an earnest reformer. However, he had not yet broken with Rome, even though he rejected the papal pension and begged forgiveness for accepting it so long. So finally, let's the papal pension go. Mm. So there's small little changes coming. Mm. Yeah. And still they're not responding. Zingli's faithfulness to the apostle Judas had appeared him to the people of Zurich and the canons of Grossmunster. He himself be became a canon of the church, replacing Dr. Heinrich Engelhardt. Now he's a full citizen of the city, he's allowed a house, a horse, and an income of 70 gulden. He welcomes the promotion and, and, he, and, and he announces, I am in the city of Zurich, bishop and pastor, he wrote. The cure for souls has been laid upon me. I have taken an oath to this effect, which the Melks have not done. 
seemingly unaware of what was happening in Germany at that time. Yet Luther's tracks were circulating freely in Switzerland by 1521. So you see how early the tracks had come there already, but he was still unaware what was happening that side. Mm. News was not traveling as quickly as one would think it did. Yeah. This while all of Europe waited anxiously for the Diet of Worms, fearing the worst. Diet of Worms, remember? Luther? Mm. Uh, they were going to determine he was to be excommunicated completely from the church, which they eventually did, given what's it, how many days before he could duplicate the city? Is it 28 days or? It was given quite some time to, to leave the city. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was it was it was like twenty eight days. But then his uncle uh, um, <laughs> kidnaps him. Kidnaps puts him, him in, that's right. in his one yes. of his own castles. Puts it, yeah, puts him in one of his castles. Yeah. If Zingwill were indeed determined to follow a reformatory course in Zurich, up to now we had been both shrewd and cautious. And this is where I want to talk to you about shrewd and cautious. Yes. Remember the word says um, Yes, Thomas Doves. Yes, no, no, what's the first part? A shrewd as serpents. A shrewd as serpents and as tame as doves. doves. Now they're not referring to a moral characteristic because animals don't have moral characteristics. No. They're simply referring to a, a, a trait. Yes. Um, or a characteristic. Well, I'm trying to think of a better word now. Um, in, also in Luke 16 8, remember the one servant who. Um, He's not working to all the books, and then um, he realizes, hey, I've got to sort this out or else my master's going to get me fired. Mm. And then he very shrewdly gets the money back. Um, and then, then the last part of that particular section in Luke 16, 8 says, is that this world, the unsaved, the ungodly is more shrewd than you. Um, the shrewdness is not so much uh, a negative. Shrewdness can actually be a positive aspect mm. of your life. Yeah. To be um, shrewd in business yes, doesn't mean you're yes. ethically bad. That's you're right. Just, you're just very sharp. You're very sharp. <laughs> and you take the chances and you're open to where you see them. Yes. So that's basically all it's doing. And this is the difference between him okay. and uh, um, Luther. Luther start seeing the differences. Mm. His theology takes a, a complete uh, change and he goes on the offensive immediately. Mm. Zwingli doesn't do that. No, no, Zwingli no. has a plan. He's got a plan. That's it. And so I what he like does yes. I'm sorry to like Zwingli. So what he does is he starts with the preaching. That's all he's doing for now. Then he's going to start adding other parts to his reformatory methodology. So that's the difference between the two. Yeah. Really distinct difference. Yes, let's not go for the point. <laughs> Zwingli's reformatory method. His first methodology is a preacher. Intentional or not, the Swiss reform had been launched from the pulpit. He resumed his exposition from Matthew's Gospel. In 1521, he preaches from Acts, Timothy, and Galatians. After some accusing him for being to Pauline, he turns to 1 Peter. 1 and 2 Peter, followed by Hebrews. 1523, he goes back to the Gospel, first look, uh, first look and then the uh, Gospel of John. 1525, middle of the year, he turns to the Old Testament for Sunday Mass. Zwingli's strategy was apparently by design, recognized as revolutionary by Conrad Hoffman. You see, someone noticed. The papers he didn't notice, but others noticed that he was busy with something and that he was very shrewd about his business. And Conrad Hoffman is one of the first to, to pick this up, who first attempted to dissuade Zwingli from following this path before officially complaining that Zwingli had departed from tradition. <laughs> so the papacy doesn't pick it up, but somebody in the canton, mm. who's still staunch Roman Catholic and very traditional, picks it up that this is, things are being changed but very quietly. So Zwingli cites the practice of Christism and Augustine in his defense. Basically what he, what he says, the tradition was very simple. There was a set out, uh, uh, there was a menu of sermons for the year. Uh -huh. He wasn't holding to it. He was preparing his own sermons. Uh, yeah. That was basically the tradition. Mm. So he simply says, listen here, uh, 
if this is a problem, let's go back to Christostom Christo Christo and Augustine. Um, there was no such practice, he says, until Charlemagne's time. So uh, what are you accusing me of? Mm. Somebody introduced it, but our fathers didn't do this. Mm. Shouldn't we uh, 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 be holding to their tradition mm. rather than to Charlemagne's? <laughs> Sure. His preaching became the most effective means of advancing the cause of reform. His progress towards the Reformation truth is difficult to trace because there's no written record or recorded sermons. His style was informal and extemporaneous. He evidently kept his congregation awake and alert and in the process he taught new doctrines. Apparently he was quite a funny guy. So he was always full of anecdotes and kept them, on, kept them wide awake while mm -hmm. preaching. Rome, anxious over his preaching, at the same time displayed tolerance for heresy in Zurich because of a dire need for Swiss troops in its ongoing power struggle with the princes of Europe. See how it works in his favor that he is Swiss. The same like Paul, it works in his fav favor that he was both a Roman and Christian. And a Jew. So, no, and we, just, yeah, he wasn't this, free, yeah, he wasn't free, he was a citizen, yeah. he was what, this, what they call free born. So, yeah. There were even hints from Rome that if Zingwili would only be patient, both reform of the church and a condol's hat for him would be the rewards. Well, uh, then you have the sausage incident. <laughs> this was a very funny thing. Two events in 1522 indicated which direction Zwingli and the Swiss Reformation were moving. Now, event one. Zwingli preached that certain traditions and practices of the Roman Catholic Church lacked biblical foundation. Now, what happened is during Lent, they would abstain from, from meat and only eat fish. Mm. But this particular printer, uh, Christopher Frosch, uh, Froschauscher, decided that because these guys were working so hard, the fish wouldn't be enough to sustain them. So he told his wife, make some sausages, please. Because Zwingli had preached on this matter and said, I'm not sure why you're abstaining from meat, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not even biblical. Mm. So he decided, well, if it's not biblical, I'm going to feed them meat because they need to work and I need to keep them going. <laughs> so he fed his workers sausages instead of fish during Lent. And the city council jangled the sausage eaters. <laughs> Event 2, March 30, Zwingli arose to their fence. They've changed their mind since. Zwingli arose to their fence in a printed sermon called Selection on Liberty Respecting Foods on Offense and Scandal, whether there is any authority for wedding meat at certain times. Well, obviously Lent in this case. The council compromised, where after the Bishop of Constance ordered an inquest. So the council and church were warned about heretical teachings. And Zwingli responded with a vigorous rebuttal. But the Bishop of Constance is resolute, he's not going to drop the issue. Hmm. So, he persuades the annual Swiss Diet meeting at Baden, a few miles from Zurich, to pass a mandate prohibiting the preaching of Reformation concepts. So, he's not only a preacher, there's also petitions. So now there's a second part being added to his, to his reform methodology. But while the Swiss Diet is in session at Baden, Zwingli is drawing up a petition that would give the bishop an even greater headache. The signers of the petition to the, to the bishop were either planning to make official their clandestine relations or intended to be married, allow me to just explain. Remember they were all celibate. But Paul clearly says, um, if you're yearning rather get married, well, yeah. well, uh, because celibacy is in fact it seems a gift according to that particular passage. Mm -hmm. So if you can't manage it, rather get married. And quite a number of these priests had actually women on the side and children already. So this is the issue that's now being taken up. To say to them, listen here, allow the guys to get married instead of them living in sin. 
A few days later, a second petition followed in German and led to the Swiss Foreign Federation asking that the preaching of the gospel not be prohibited and that no one take offense when priests married in order to avoid scandal. Petition carrying 11 signatures included Wings Zwingli and were put into print by Frosia and distributed by Zwingli and his friends. They have the preaching now. Now he starts petitioning on certain traditions. But that's not all. Now he starts writing. He's going to the pen like Luther. To his reform methodology, Zwingli added the printed page. In 1522, on the 15th of August, he finishes the preface to his studied answer to the bishop's charge entitled Archelitis, the beginning and the end. Even though it was the most complete attack on the unbiblical nature of the teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church to date, it was by no means the end. September 6, Wingley, in another sermon, says for the principle that the Holy Spirit, and the he was preaching to a set, uh, to a, at, at a convent with only nuns, and he's saying to them, according to the scripture, only the Holy Spirit can help one understand the word. Hence, councils and popes are useless for this purpose. So this thing is growing. But he's also a teacher. You see, all the, besides getting into the conference and stuff, he's also now getting into the university. He's getting into the halls of learning. And then you must see the last part, because the last part is even... That, that to me is the most brilliant of, of the methodology that he uses. It. So remember he's now he's moving, in amongst his, he's moving amongst the common people because he's a parish priest. But there's also visitors coming to the town to listen to his sermons now. Who also comes every seven years because of the dedication of the, de of the shrine which they celebrate. So everybody's hearing about his preaching. Petitions is being signed. Um, he's now going to the written pen. But he's also a teacher, so on a local level he's now being known. Mm. He at the bottom end. Mm. So he's just preaching to them at the moment. Mm. They're not engaging him as such. Mm. And that's the last part of the methodology, where they are allowed to engage mm. and to be part of the decision making. This guy is brilliant. Mm. So first he's just preaching. Petitions, he gets actively involved in the social issues of the day and also the traditions of the church at the same time. He then starts writing, and then he's at also a group of young university students by one by one become his ardent disciples and earnest students of the word, including one named Conrad Grebel, of which we'll see in the second lesson quite a bit. Sessions of the embryonic seminary were termed prophecy meetings where the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures were studied in their respective languages with the aid of the Latin Vulgate well and German editions. What they do is they will carefully scrutinize the word, definitions of words, um, and with some interpretive notes, and then they would choose one of the scholars in the group or the students and he would preach on that particular passage. This is how they grew in the word. Okay, All right, yeah. Which makes a lot of sense. It's actually a cool method to think if you can get a group of guys together. You sit, mm. work out the meanings and stuff, and then ask this guy to put a sermon together and to preach. Yeah. Yeah. Good practice. Yeah. Um, then a sermon followed, preached by one of the number, the local Swiss German. In this way, he really developed a hardcore support from a local group of gifted young men from among the finest families in the city. And here's his last part, the disputer. By the end of 1522, Zingli's reformatory methodology was almost complete. To preaching, teaching, COVID ag agitation and writing, he was to add disputation. A significant departure from the traditional use of disputation was moving the, the disputation from the universities to the town hall, to the city hall. Mm. Remember, that's where the normal people would be. Mm. And thus making the 200 members of the council the judges. So you don't have the all of learning now. You have ordinary people mm. sitting down, reading the word, listening to the presentations, and being told, listen, but you too have a mind. You too can think. Let me present something to you and confirm if it's logical and makes sense. Mm. Well, I'm trying to put it in my own words mm. now. But the setting, the first disputation, 1523, 
Bishop of Constance refused an invitation to Zurich, but sent his very able vicar general, Johann Fabri. Now, see what happens here. Zwingli prepares 67 articles and 600 men attended the occasion in the city hall on January 29. Since September 1522, he was acting like a true reformer, actively promoting distributing Luther's tracts. He's already distributing Luther's tracts as well, besides his own writings, and German New Testament. One significant action after another, supporting him and his teaching came forth from town hall. Rome finally reacts. A letter of reconciliation from Pope Adrian IV on, or VI on January 23, but there was no turning back for Zingli. January 29 is the day of the first disputation, with most of Europe's focus on Zurich. The symbol body was not particularly auspicious. The delegation from Constance and a professor from Tübingen, the only foreign dig dignitaries. The clergy, the laity, the ordinary man and the council filled the hall. Zwingli, standing in the midst with the Hebrew, Greek and Latin text of scripture, open a table before him. You see where he's going and where he's heading. He's got no other materials from none of his writings. General Fabri, in effect, the papacy, because he's representing the papacy. First of all, he's a farmer. He's outnumbered because there's no other delegations there from any other of the European nations. And remember, the papacy owes the Swiss a lot of money still for the mercenary trade. So there he's sitting, outnumbered, and he's soon to be outwitted also. Because basically, what is he going to do there? He then states to them, listen here, I didn't come here to debate. I came merely to investigate. So now what? Then they push him a little bit and they say to him, listen guy, uh, here's the problem. There are certain traditions and practices by the Roman Catholic Church, which is unbiblical. Mm -hmm. And this is what the word says. And if, yeah, so if it's not established by God or not, you need to uh, refute that because that is why we met here. If you're not here for that reason, then, yeah. The word of Zwingli insists that the word of God alone was competent to judge, not men. Apparently, Clavi famed he convinced a, a priest uh, on his, on his, while he was on his journey um, of his early Reformation doctrine from Scripture. So they asked him to bring forth the same passages and to present his case. Because maybe some of those passages will refute the doctrine of Zwingli too. And he couldn't do that. Council and the Burgomaster issues a mandate approving Zwickley and demanded that all clergy follow his lead. Remember, it's the same luck in Germany. And the Frederick the Wise, he let everything happen in his district and in his rule. That's the only way they can actually save Luther. This is happening in the Swiss capital. They're already independent. They're in Zurich. So it's not like the papacy can come in and just go to war with them. This is just not a little town somewhere stuck, stuck mm. somewhere where they can just go in. The right to preach freely the gospel as England and the could hardly have been stated more forcibly. The Reformation had won a significant battle in Zurich. However, what was meant was spelled out in the 67 articles. The first 15 of Christ centered. And the next 51 condemns ancient rules, regulations and practices of the Roman Church that you can read on your own. For Zingli it was clear that the Gospel is, as it is revealed in Christ is judged over all teachings of men. In the Gospel one learns that human doctrines and decrees do not aid in salvation. That's the 16th one because 15 plus 51 only makes 66. So I was looking for the other one. When they said 15, yeah. 51, and I'm saying that's 66, that's not 67. In any case, there's the other one. The following articles Zingli proceeded to demolish long held teachings of the Roman Catholic Church on light of his understanding. And these articles reveal the true radicalism of Zingli. He denounces quite a bit of the theology. The Q 
key, one of the key things that he deals with is obviously the Lord's Supper. And that we will deal with in the next lesson. Not a concept of his own, but it's something that he'd learned from, from the other reformers or from of the previous reformers. But that same the, the con his concept of the Lord's Supper would become a, a, a stumbling block between him and others and Luther as well because they never saw eye to eye on the matter. In fact he totally becomes different from all of them. I think he ends up with the symbolic one. Zwingli. Besides the fact that he never, that he actually in his last years, that we'll see in the next lesson, he, he goes off the mark on some issues again. Mm. That is the one thing which he is clear on, and it's the Lord's Supper. He does not divert from it. He ends up with, in fact, I think, oh, who does he agree with? A guy by the name of Wun, I think. The only thing is, once he decides on this, he also decides it's not time is not the right to implement the change. Mm. Mm. So again, strategy. So the disputations are very simple. It's the word, it's sola scriptura. Mm. That was the God of the Reformation. Sola scriptura. Argue from the word, word. or don't argue at all. Yeah. Prove it from the word. And here we're sitting with the second one. And that's what happened in the first one. He said to the, the, the vicar, listen, these are the traditions. I can refute them perfectly. Um, you need to refute what I'm saying, but you also need to do it from the same book. Yeah. That's it. So here we're sitting at the second disputation on the October the 26th to 28th in 1523. But he also has Leo Judd. Um, remember the two, f the, the the friends earlier mm. we mentioned. Both express a deep aversion to the pagan and superstitious use of made of Im images and provoked an outburst of iconoclasm. Vandalism of churches follows, and so did the rest of the Vandalists, obviously. Same like the sausage event. <laughs> if you go against the tradition, you're going to get arrested. Mm. It was the order of the day. So the second disputation is... Yeah, they obviously went into the churches and started vandalizing, breaking down the... And they, they took down the one cross at the, at the one convent. Um, and that's what got them arrested. But here, the main issue, there's, there's three of them actually. One is the, 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 the images, second one is the mess, and the third is purgatory. However, they never get to the issue of purgatory on this disputation mm. because the second issue of mass takes up all, all the time and becomes like I said a stumbling block between Luther, Zwingli and a few others. Mm. Remember there was the issue of what we call transubstantiation where the priest would utter a few words and the bread would become the body mm. and uh, uh, blood of Christ. Uh, then there was consubstantiation where the presence, the real presence of God was always in the bread and the wine. Um, yeah, they say it's different. <laughs> and then you add a third, which comes along at the end, which swingly actually develops yeah. from the word. And then we also have the Anabaptists that come along. Because that's the other issue. Um, not only the Lord's Supper, but baptism becomes an issue. So, besides the hundreds of men that goes up to Rathius on October 26, you have 500 priests sitting there, 10 guys with earned doctorates, and two city councils. When it comes to images, they are virtually unanimous in the condemnation and declares it an abomination in the sight of God repeatedly condemned by one speaker after another. On the second day, that's the first day, Mass is on the agenda. 
Also it was described in Judges, judged as an abomination before God. And here's the problem, yet no instruction had been forthcoming for the abolition of the mash. They discussed it, called it an abomination, but there's no action to now implement it mm. and actually make the, do, make, make the actual change and go to the people and the congregants and say to them, listen here, this is how we're going to do it from now on. Yeah. And here comes Conrad Grebel, one of his students. Insisted on instruction regarding the mass and the immediate end of the unbiblical form. Zwingli argued that the Zurich Custody Council be handled the charge for deciding what measures would be taken from this point on regarding changes in the mass. It seems that there was an argument between Conrad and, and Zwingli at one stage and it became heated mm. when Zwingli clarified, I'm leery, handing it over them to say what, when and how. I'm not saying we're not, the changes is the changes must not be made or that the old form is unbiblical. I'm just handing over to them saying, listen here, let's do it gradually. Let's implement it, but let's do it gradually. Again, strategy. Mm. Conrad Grebel is saying, no, we need to go on the offensive. It's unbiblical and therefore it needs to change. In the first matter, we decided and we changed. Now, mm. on this matter, we're stalling. The session closes and the mass discussion is, is left over for the following day. But during that, that evening, uh, apparently Zwingli, Vadian, Hummeyer and Grebel came together uh, and said they will go back to the issue of mass before they discuss purgatory, because purgatory they can deal with later. Grebel points out uh, to, to the many abuses in, in the previous discussion uh, of, the, of the previous day in the Mass, not yet made plain. Then Hoopmaya delivers a carefully thought at five point sermon on the Mass. And he says, listen, if we're going to do Mass, then according to the word, make sure that it's a celebration in the local town mm. and not um, in, in, a, in, in Latin like they used to do it. Because mm. Christ didn't speak gibberish when he did it with his, with, with his disciples. So why should we speak gibberish and people can't understand us? Mm. So let's do it in the local tongue first of all. Mm. The gospel must be preached as ma at Mass. If we are going to do Mass, because we are doing it in remembrance of our Lord, then surely we must preach the gospel because it yeah. refers back to what he did. Yeah. But that Mass is an act of communal fellowship in the company of believers. In other words, there's no place for private mass. He implied that both bread and wine are to be taken by all the brethren. Remember at that stage it was only the bread being put on the tongue. The priest was the only one that was drinking the wine. He in essence agreed with Grebel and Zwingli on these aspects. Zwingli joined in the con condemnation of the abuses. Grebel and Zwingli did not fully agree with each other though. Zwingli at times arguing that one could not be absolutely sure about the details of the Last Supper. You see yeah, how he's, he's saying one thing but he's not fully into it. And this becomes problematic mm. for him later in his life. 